Today is Easter, the day we commemorate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We commemorated his crucifixion last week. Today it's his resurrection from the dead, and just in a few weeks it'll be his ascension. And Christians believe Jesus did all that for a purpose, that it accomplished something. And today I'd like to look at what it accomplished. Now, depending on how and where you grew up in Christianity, you may have been taught to believe that what it accomplished would be to allow people who believed in Jesus to go to heaven instead of hell for eternity. And those who don't believe in Jesus will go to hell. And they'll be tormented for all eternity. Now if you read through the Gospels, you will see that what Jesus preached when he was here on earth was repentance. In Mark chapter 1, right at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, he says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And in the book of Luke, he says, Unless you repent, you will also perish. And so this seems to mean that those who repent will enjoy eternal life in heaven. Those who don't will spend eternity in hell. Probably the most well-known verse in the Bible is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John goes on in verse 33 to say, Jesus says, He who believes on the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe shall not see life. And so this seems to mean that those who believe in Jesus will go to heaven. Those who do not will not. The Bible never makes things simple for us, though. It always says something else. And in this case, Jesus says in John 12, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now, a lot of times people interpret that by saying Jesus lifted up, meaning that Jesus lifted up on the cross. But actually what that refers to is Jesus' ascension into heaven. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And both the book of Romans and the book of Philippians talk about how every knee will bow to God and every tongue will acclaim God. We heard 1 Corinthians 15 say, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Romans chapter 5 says, For though one man's disobedience made the many sinners, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. And that's talking about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, eating the fruit and spoiling things from then on. Everyone. Spoiled it for everyone. But it's also talking about Jesus restoring things. For everyone. Remember how Paul wrote, every knee will bow and every tongue will acclaim God. First Corinthians said, all will be made alive in Jesus. Romans says, all will be made righteous through Jesus. Notice these passages, there is an emphasis on all. Now, one of the verses, if you grew up in one of those churches where they banged the pulpit and stomped around and threatened you with burning in hell for all eternity, you've probably heard this verse a lot. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 2.23. You know, that's the first phrase of one sentence. And the sentence is completed in verse 24. Verse 24 says, All being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, conveniently, those who want to scream at you for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, leave out the part, all being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's talking about all. <coughs> and so we're left with a problem. The New Testament is full of stern warnings for those who did not repent. However, it also contains many things that indicate that all people will be saved. And this problem has been around since the beginning of Christianity and from the very beginning of recorded Christian history there have been people who believed that everyone 
in the end will be saved. If you read the Bible, Old and New Testaments both, you'll see that there's a, almost two different pictures of God in the Bible. There's one God who is ready to pounce on you and jump out at you and grab you and make you pay for every little thing you do wrong. Now, that God delights in revenge, in making you pay. And we see that God in Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember, a man owed his master a tremendous amount of money, couldn't pay, and he went in there and he said the master was going to sell him into slavery and all. He said, no, please don't, I'll pay you. So the master forgave the debt. And then he went out and one of his fellow servants owed him a few coins and he had that man thrown into prison. And Jesus said, and so the master called him in and sent him to prison for being mean like that. And Jesus said, this is what God will do to you if you don't forgive others from your heart. And so that's the God that exacts justice, delights in revenge, the stern God. But there's another God in the Bible. This God is loving and merciful. Psalm 103 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in kindness. And that picture of God is found throughout the Bible also, in the New Testament as well as the Old. And so people ask, how could a God who is loving and merciful and kind assign some people to hell for all eternity? <coughs> now the Old Testament especially asserts that God is a God of justice. God pays back good for good and evil for evil. But you know, you just think about it a minute. It doesn't matter how bad of a person you've been in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. Could anyone do something bad enough in a short human lifespan to deserve eternity in hell? You know, you just think about that. Is it not overkill? Let's say somebody lives 80 years old and they bring untold misery and all on people. Do they still deserve eternal punishment in hell? You see, a lot of times when we think about eternal punishment in hell, we don't have a concept of eternal, but it never ends. Never. And you just think about that. You're in hell for 10 billion years, and it's never going to end, ever. Does anyone deserve that? Does anyone really deserve that? If God is really a God of love, mercy, and kindness, and if God is really a God of justice, can God assign some people to eternity in hell? From 1 Corinthians 15, we heard a little while ago about how Jesus will remain, Jesus will reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. It says he will subdue all things and then God will be God all in all. Now you think that Jesus called God his father and told us to call God our Father, how can God be all in all if he loses any of his children? Remember in the parable of the lost sheep, the shepherd did not rest until he had found the lost sheep and brought it back. In the parable of the lost coin, the woman did not rest until she found that coin and she had all of her coins. In the account of Noah and the ark in Genesis, it says how God saw how evil everything on the earth was and he decided to wipe out everything except Noah and his family and the life on the ark. But you know, just right afterwards, if you'll read that account, it says that God regretted it. And God promised Noah he would never do that again. And that's what the rainbow is the sign of, God's promise that he would never do that again. So God regretted it. And you know, that line of thought is in the big account of the Old Testament with the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people displeased God, and God withdrew his favor from them, and they split into two groups of people, the Israelites and the Jews. The Assyrians came in and took over the Israelites. 
Then the Babylonians came in and took over the Jews. And if you go into the latter part of the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Lamentation, it talks about how God felt sorry for the people for what he had done. He felt that he had punished them too much. And in Isaiah chapter 40, God says, Comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. And God promises to restore them. God felt bad that he had punished them. You know, these passages indicate that there is a tender-hearted side to God. The Old Testament, as well as the New, contains the idea that God punishes, but then he regrets it, and he restores things. Is this the kind of God who's going to watch someone scream in hell for all eternity, never end? You know, if the Old Testament portrays God as later regretting what he did to punish people on earth, how could God stand by and watch while billions and billions and trillions of people screamed in hell for all eternity? And that's why so many Christians do believe that in the end all will be saved. But that belief does not imply that people will get off scot-free for what they've done. There are major variations within that belief and they all include some kind of consequences for people for how they've lived their lives. Some people believe that those who did not repent and believe in Jesus will go to some temporary place of punishment after their death. After their death they will be punished for a while but then they'll go on to heaven. That is the idea of Gehenna that is found in the New Testament. It is also from where the Catholic idea of purgatory came from. Those who support this view go to Matthew 25. Well, remember Jesus comes back and he separates everybody out into the sheep and the goats. And the sheep are the ones that enter into life and joy. And the goats are the ones that go to what it calls in the King James Bible eternal punishment. But if you go to that word in the Greek, you'll see that punishment is actually the word for pruning. And in all the uses of that word in classical Greek, it, remain, it connotates pruning. Like you go out and prune a rose bush or prune a fig bush or something. And when you prune a bush, you cut out all the dead wood and you make the bush stronger. You don't destroy a bush when you prune it. You make it stronger. And that word for eternal there is not the Greek word that is used in the other parts of the Bible to refer to that it's literally a word that can be used to refer to God. And so the proper translation of that really is that these, the goats are going for God's pruning. And God works with them and makes them into what they need to be in order to eventually enter heaven. There are passages in the New Testament though that admittedly do talk about eternal fire. And there are other places in the Bible, like Mark chapter 9, where Jesus talks about a fire that is not quenched. But it's interesting to note that the fire is what is called eternal. It is not said that people are put in there for eternity. It is only said that the fire burns eternally. Others have another idea about how, how all will be saved. They believe that while all people may not repent and believe in Jesus in this life, that they will after their deaths. And they point to something Jesus said in John chapter 5, the time is coming and it now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. Now it doesn't say that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and some of those who hear it will live. It says that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That's a collective statement. And those who hear it, that is all the dead, will live. And that's one verse that people point to to support the idea that people who die from this life lost without being saved will have another opportunity after their death. And at that time they will be saved. That, by the way, is the position of Orthodox Christianity. 
Now, yet another idea is that there will be levels in heaven. And when you get to heaven, your place in heaven will be determined by what you did in your life. And this is something that Jesus said. This goes back to something Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you can interpret that to mean that not everybody's equal in heaven. Your place there will depend on how you've lived your life. Those who did not live right or those who did not repent and believe in Jesus will be in heaven. They just won't be on the same level as those who did. And finally, there is the idea among some who believe in universal salvation that those who do not repent in their earthly lives receive bad things in this life so that they pay for all that they've done in this life. Maybe bad things happen to them. Maybe it's things we don't see. Maybe it's just that they're tormented in their minds or something. But in some way, they pay before they leave this life. So saying that in the end everyone will be saved does not necessarily mean that you can do anything you want to and get by with it. But it is saying that ultimately, when the dust is settled, no one will burn in hell for all eternity. And eventually, the all will have a place in heaven. And this idea is not new. As I said before, it's been around since the beginning of Christianity, and it can be supported by Bible passages. And you know, I think that's what most people actually do believe, although they'd be hard-pressed to admit it. You know, we might give lip service to saying that only those who repent and believe in Jesus will be in heaven. But when that woman down the road from you dies that's been so nice to you for all these years, and you really think a lot of her, and she's been a good friend to you for the past 25 years, and she's a fine, upstanding woman, but you know she was not a Christian, you're not going to think she's going to hell. You're going to think she's going to be in heaven. Now, some of the more fundamentalist-minded people might think that, but even they, I don't think, would think that. That woman down the road you've been friends with for all these years that was a good woman in every way except that she just wasn't a Christian, you're not going to believe she went to hell. And most people, I think, reserve the idea of hell for people who they think are really, really, really evil. Like I know that people, you know, uh, like to imagine, say, Adolf Hitler being in hell or Timothy McVeigh or in this world today, if you've done what the news has told you to believe, you will want Vladimir Putin to be in hell or somebody like that. But you cannot support that kind of idea from the Bible. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. There are two ideas you can support from the Bible. Number one, you can support the Bible, the view from the Bible that everyone will be saved. That has Bible support. It does. Number two, you can support the idea from the Bible that only those who repent and believe in Jesus will be in heaven. Only those. And that everybody who does not repent and believe in Jesus will be in hell. You can get biblical support for that idea. There is none, and I mean absolutely no biblical support to say that hell is populated only by those we see as the most despicable. Cannot do it. It is not in there. The Bible gives us two choices. Either everyone who does not believe in Jesus, everyone ends up in hell, or everyone ends up in heaven. Those are the only two positions you can support from the Bible. You can't have your neighbor down the street who was a good woman, but she just wanted a Christian to go to heaven and just having people like Adolf Hitler Going to hell, you can't do that. One way or the other, you've got to choose. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is talking about Jesus and he says this, Whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since time began. Now that's an interesting phrase from the Bible that we don't think of very often, the restoration of all things. 
But remember in 1 Corinthians we heard, Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There is the idea here in the New Testament that what happens in Jesus reverses the effects of Adam and Eve eating the fruit in the Garden of Eden. What happened in Jesus reverses the effects of Adam and Eve eating the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And so things come full circle. That's the restoration of all things. And for this Easter, I'd like for you to consider that what Jesus really accomplishes is the reversal of Adam and Eve eating the fruit. The reversal of the effects of that. It may not be what we've heard a lot of times, but I think it's something to consider. That the work of Jesus consists in the reversal of Adam and Eve eating the fruit.